Well, good morning. Oh, you guys are so much better at that than a lot of groups. You normally have to say it a few times, but y'all are right on top of it. Hey, my name is Nick Rowland, and uh, I have been blessed to be a part of this church for 23 years now, and, uh, and I get to serve. Did you know that there's a congregation that meets here on Saturday nights? Yeah, we have two congregations uh, that share this Rogers campus together, Fellowship Mosaic on Saturday night and then Fellowship Rogers on Sunday morning, and uh, the Mosaic congregation is is very similar to what happens here on Sunday morning. We follow the same teaching series, um, have similar kind of worship, just a little bit more laid back because people don't have time to get changed into different clothes coming off the ball fields on their way to church on Saturday night. And so um, we have services on 5 and 6.30, and you're always welcome to come join us on Saturday night. But I am super blessed and excited uh, to be here this morning as we kick off the book of Ephesians. I love this book, and I'm thrilled for our church to get to dive into this study together um, and catch a vision for what, really catch God's vision for his church. What does he desire us as a people to be, to do, and to look like? And we have this study guide right here um, that we are going to use through the course this fall to walk through Ephesians. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have one and you would like one right now, you can raise your hand and keep it up and some ushers are going to bring it to you. These cost $10. We're not making any money off these things. We're trying to cover the cost of printing. So we're just going to do an honor system. Uh, if you want a book, raise your hand. Somebody will bring it to you. You can pay on the way out. Keep it up and they'll bring them around. And don't worry, we have undercover spies watching you. So if you're going to try to sneak out, it's not going to happen. Um, but I encourage you, there's a section in this book where you can take notes on what we're doing today. So I encourage you, get those out, you get a pen, and uh, let's jump right in. I want to tell you a little bit about this book, a little bit about the book of Ephesians and, and what the background is. People have called this Paul's magnum opus, the, the, the crown jewel of his writing. And I think some of it has to do with the situation that Paul is in when he wrote this letter. So Paul was an apostle, a, a, an appointed missionary by Jesus to establish the early churches. And so what he would do is he would go city to city and he would bring the good news of Jesus. He would tell people about the gospel. They would come to faith in him and he'd organize them into a church. And he'd spend a little bit of time getting them established and setting some leadership in place and then he'd move on to the next city. And you can imagine this new faith that's exploding. If they only have you know, a few weeks, months, at most years with this missionary, they're gonna have questions things are going to come up. And so often they would send a letter to Paul saying, hey, Paul, we're facing this. What do we do about it? And he would write a letter back with his answer. And most of our letters from Paul, that's the way they look. There's a very specific problem that Paul is answering and guiding the people in. Ephesians is a little different. You see, the city of Ephesus is a place Paul had spent three years with. He had a lot of time with them. And then sometime later, we're not exactly sure the gap of time, he's in prison and he sits down to write this letter to the church at Ephesus, and there doesn't seem to be any one issue that he's addressing in this letter. There's not one big problem that he's saying, okay, let me talk about this issue with you. As a result, Paul gets to pull back a little bit and write this summary of the good news about Jesus, this big picture overview. How, do you, how does he encapsulate everything we know about what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing in his church? And that's one of the things that makes this book so special is it covers such a wide breadth. I think we'll see that as we dive in. To tell you a little bit about the city of Ephesus and some of the things they would have been facing, um, one of the things that marked this city out is it is in a place in modern-day Turkey um, that at the time they would have called Asia Minor. It was one of the top three most significant cities in the ancient world. And one of the reasons was it was a gateway to Rome for all everything in the east that wanted to trade in Rome, things came through Ephesus. So that made it incredibly financially successful. But there's another unique marker of Ephesus, and it is this beautiful building, the Temple of Artemis. This is one of, this is, it's in ruins now. This is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. A a staggering sight to behold. Such a significant, important temple that the Caesars would store their wealth in this temple because they knew it was one of the safest places to put them. And it was dedicated to the worship of the Greek goddess Artemis. And it was a place that people would come from all over the world to seek Artemis' favor, to seek her protection. And one of the things that was prominent in this time was a fear of dark spiritual powers. 
Um, there was a fear that people could put a curse on you, put a curse on your business, put a curse on your family. And so people would look to Artemis for protection, to protect them. They would come to the temple where they believe Artemis had blessed, where Artemis dwelt, and seek her protection on their lives. Now that led to another little economic boon for the city of Ephesus because craftsmen would shape these little statues of Artemis that they would sell right outside the temple. It's a little bit like going to Disney World. You go have the experience of your life and you wanna bring a little of the magic home, right? So you get the souvenirs to bring home with you. The idea was if you bought a statue of Artemis from the temple of Artemis and brought it home with you, Artemis would keep her eyes on you and your family. You could bring a little bit of the blessing of the temple home with you and she would protect your home, she would look out for you. And this is the worldview of what's going on in the city of Ephesus at this time. Now, when Paul comes to plant the church, to plant the gospel in Ephesus, it turns everything upside down because he shows up and says, actually, I wanna tell you about someone who is higher than Artemis. That is more powerful than any God you've ever heard of. He's, he's actually the one who created everything seen and unseen, and he's enthroned in heaven above it all. And guess what? He doesn't live, and these words would have been so shocking for people living in the shadow of this temple. He doesn't live in a temple. He lives in heaven, and he oversees everything. And when you trust him, you don't need to buy a statue for him to go with you. He actually goes with you by indwelling you by his spirit. And this really threatened the people of Ephesians, particularly those making money off of the Artemis trade. So they start a riot. In a, in a theater like this, it may have been this theater, um, in Ephesus, they got a whole large group of people together and they start chanting about this good news that is upending the whole world. And what are we gonna do about this, this gospel that is disrespecting our goddess Artemis? And so you see that the, the good news of Jesus is confronting directly everything the Ephesians believed about protection, about significance, about their economy. It challenged everything. And this is the context that the gospel came into. Now, you can actually still walk the streets of Ephesus today. You can, you can see the place that this would, have, this would have happened, the way it would have unfolded. You can see this theater. That would be a dream of mine to get to walk the streets of Ephesus and see this history real, for real. And that dream is coming true next year for Sam Hannon and not me. So... <laughs> Hey, Sam's gonna be leading a trip to, to go through the Mediterranean Sea on the journeys of Paul, and you're gonna get to see all of these cities that Paul wrote to and get to see what this ancient Roman world looked like. You know, when we, when we read the Old Testament and the Gospels, it's the world of Israel that this is taking place in. But as the church starts to expand, it enters the Roman world, it enters the Western world, and that's a different culture with different issues. And we get to see that the good news of Jesus applies to both and it can spread into any context in the world. And so this is gonna be an awesome opportunity uh, to go on this trip. They're still taking signups now. If you wanna jump in there, you can just email J-O-P, which stands for Journeys of Paul, at fellowshipnwa.org. If you wanna jump on this trip next June, it's gonna be a really cool opportunity. Um, I figured I would let, that, let all of you know what an opportunity all of you have with you and Sam and not me. So, hey, as we walk through this book, um, what we're gonna see is that Paul is gonna lay a foundation. The first half of the book is gonna really focus on the work of God, that, what God has done in creating his church. The mission of God and the good news of God, he's gonna shape who the church is. And the second half is gonna focus on how the church should respond, how we live as a result. And that's always the order that New Testament instruction comes in. First, let's understand what God has done. God is always the first actor. And then how do we respond in faith to what God has done? There's one verse that I think stands over um, all of the book of Ephesians that I think could be a powerful banner verse to really get what Paul is trying to drive home. And it comes in chapter three. Uh, in Ephesians chapter three, verses 10 and 11, it's talking about what God's intent was in creating the church. And it says, his intent was that now through the church, his manifold, the manifold wisdom of God should be known, made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Get this, there is a spiritual realm that covers the cosmos. 
And Paul says that God's infinite wisdom is being put on display in the heavens through what happens in a little local church. When the people of God learn to live like the people of God, angels and spiritual realms get to see how great God is. That's the significance of what we do when we gather together and follow Jesus. It's a pretty incredible thing. I'm excited to jump into this journey with you. Let's start in Ephesians chapter one, verse one. Open your Bibles and let's go. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Uh, this greeting plays out like so many other greetings of ancient letters. There was a form uh, that they all knew to follow. You remember this? I don't know, it was like third grade when you learned how to write a letter and you learned the little form, dear so-and-so, sincerely sign me, put the date in the top right-hand corner, you have a bottom of the letter. We learned that there's a form to writing letters. There was a form to writing letters back then too. And it would start with an introduction of who the author is. And we meet that it's Paul and he says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus, meaning he has been selected by Jesus with the authority to direct the church with the word of God. And it's written to God's holy people in Ephesus. Uh, that word holy people, we often translate it as saint. And I think the reason the NIV hasn't used the word saint here is because that word saint has come to mean something different to most of us in culture today. When he, we hear the word saint, we tend to think a super extra spiritual person who's above and beyond all the other spiritual people, right? But that's not at all what this word meant in the original context. Uh, the word saint or holy person to be holy means to be set apart, to be set aside for a special purpose. In our home, we have a, a plate we call the happy plate. It's one of those hand-painted, baked plates that has the word happy written on it in rainbow colors. And it has been set apart for the purpose of birthday breakfast. That's what it's there for. That means in our home, it only comes out three times a year for the person whose birthday it is to eat on that plate. So what would happen if tomorrow morning, which is not my birthday, I woke up and heated up a Pop-Tart on the happy plate? There would be pandemonium in the Roland household because I would have defiled the happy plate, okay? I would be using it for something other than the purpose it was set aside for. That's what it means to be holy, to be a holy person. It is not a measure of how good you are. It is a statement that you don't belong to you anymore. When you believe in Jesus, your life has been set aside for God. All that you are is now his. It is now set apart for his purposes. And Paul says, all the faithful in Jesus, everyone who's put their faith in Christ, you are now a holy person. You are now a saint. Your life belongs to God. And he's gonna explain to us what it looks like to live that life that has been set apart to God. And he prays over them grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he prays grace and experience of God's favor and peace, pulling, up, pulling from the Hebrew idea of shalom, that it is everything working together in your life the way God meant for it to. And then we jump in to verse three, the first major section of this letter. And Paul writes in verse three, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So right out of the gate, what Paul is doing is he's offering praise to God. And he's doing it in a very particular form that his original audience would have recognized. Um, we can't see this in our English translation, but that word praise is actually the same word as blessed and blessing. So if we were rendering this in a very literal way, it would, say, it would say, blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And when Paul does this, when he pulls on this idea of, by opening with blessed be God, he's actually repeating a kind of psalm. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, there were these psalms, 150 of them, that were there for people to worship God with. It was their songbook. And there was a certain kind of psalm that was called a blessing psalm. And it would always start the same way. Blessed be the Lord God who has. And then it would go on to list all the things God has done for us. Blessed be the Lord God who rescued us out of Egypt. 
Blessed be the Lord God who has protected our king. And one of the things we learn from those Psalms is God blesses us by acting on our behalf. The way we bless God is by recounting back to him the things that he's done in gratitude. So Paul, in verse three, he's writing a blessing song. He's laying out for the people of Ephesians a prayer of blessing to bless God for what he's done. But he's gonna do something in this song that is unlike anything we see in the Old Testament Psalms that transforms the way we understand how God's blessings come to us. And we gotta talk about this word blessing because that word has kind of lost its meaning. Not just kind of, it's com- almost completely lost its meaning in our culture. Where do you most typically hear the word bless in American English today? Bless you when you sneeze. And right after that is, yeah, bless your heart. That's in the South whenever you wanna say something really mean to somebody, but you wanna sound nice while you say it. Like she is just the ugliest thing I've ever seen, bless her heart, Right? Okay, so you bless your heart. And then we have hashtag blessed, which is something we usually say after we've experienced something good, like a really great meal or our kid won their t-ball game or something like that. We talk about how blessed we are. Okay, the word blessed may have gotten watered down a little bit, but its opposite has not because the opposite of blessing is curse. And we know what it means to curse someone, right? I don't need examples right now out loud. But to curse someone is to use strong language to harm another person. And if you have a a, a magical view, you might even imagine that you're gonna use words to bring a supernatural harm on another person. So if cursing is using your words to bring harm on other people, blessing someone is using words to bring good to others. Now, when we try to bless someone, the most we can really do is offer a prayer. If I say bless you, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm offering a prayer that God would do good for you. But what happens when God blesses someone? Like back in Genesis when he made mankind and he said, bless you, you are blessed. The God who when he speaks and says, let there be light, there is light. When he says, bless you, guess what? You're blessed. Good things are gonna happen. And it says here that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, that he has brought good things into our life. And what Paul's gonna do is he's about to lay out what those blessings are. Almost every time I've ever heard this paragraph taught, I've heard it highlighted that this is one long sentence in English and one long sentence in the original Greek. And and usually we'll talk about like what a hard, difficult, run-on sentence it is that Paul wouldn't have passed sixth grade grammar um, in class today. And it makes it sound like Paul was a terrible writer Um, The reality is, it makes for bad writing in English, but it was actually beautiful, well-written Greek because it's not meant to be a paragraph with a topic sentence and three pieces of supporting evidence. Paul is actually employing a kind of rhetoric that would have been recognized to his original audience because what he's doing, it's a little bit like a political speech today. Sometimes politicians might grab a single phrase that they'll hang on to and they'll talk about their accomplishments and then say that phrase over and again. And you're not looking for really precise grammar. The rhythm of it drives it home. Or like the Lockridge sermon, that's my king. A phrase and then refrain. That's my king. A phrase and then refrain. That is how this paragraph is written. And some of the feel of it gets lost in English, but I think visually we might be able to see it if we lay it out like this. This is what the rhythm would have felt like for somebody hearing this read in Greek the first time. For he chose us in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. His glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood. He made known to us the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen And you also were included in Christ. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Do you get the point? You see, Paul is taking this psalm that they would have heard celebrating all the ways God has blessed us and he's saying every blessing that comes from God comes through Jesus Christ, his son. That is the point of this, what seems like a long run-on sentence, which is actually a beautifully constructed prayer, is to drive home the point. Every good thing that God does in your life, he accomplishes through Jesus. So now, 
Let's walk through this list of blessings and catch a glimpse of what exactly it is that Paul is celebrating that God has done for us. Verse four, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in sight. In love, he predestined us. Everybody gasp. (gasps) We're gonna talk about predestination this morning and there's gonna be a fight and people are gonna get angry. No, I hope that doesn't happen, but we will have to talk about it because it's there. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Okay, so we gotta talk about that word predestination. Who in here has heard of predestination before? Who in here has gotten a fight with someone over predestination before? Who in here has felt a little bit of anxiety about their faith because of predestination before? Okay, good. We gotta talk about it. The word predestination um, has caused a lot of consternation and conflict trying to understand um, what it means. I didn't ask the trick question, who in here believes in predestination? Um, It's a trick question because if we believe the scriptures, we have to believe in predestination because it's right there. It says God predestined us. The question is, what does it mean that God predestined us? Um, And we think about this word predestination. Um, A lot of times breaking a word down to its roots is not particularly helpful in understanding it. So like if I tried to teach you what the word butterfly meant by going, well, take butter and make it fly, um, that would not be a very good explanation of what a butterfly is. But this is actually a word where breaking it down to its roots really does give you the meaning. Destination is where you're gonna end up. It's your destiny, It's, it's, it's the end of the road. And then pre means before. So predestination means determining someone's destiny beforehand. Determining where they're gonna end up beforehand. So Paul is saying that God has predestined you, the church, those who are in Christ, to be his children. So how does that work and why does that cause so much trouble? Well, for many people, it it creates this fear and this concern that We are automatons living out a script that God wrote. Our choices are meaningless. Nothing we say or do has any effect on reality. And anyone not predestined, God just casts aside and doesn't care about. That's the concern that wells up in a lot of people as this topic comes up. When we look at how to understand theologically what's happening in predestination, there are several views. Here are four that are are very popular, commonly pointed to. One is that predestination refers to God choosing who will believe, that God is setting the destiny of who will ultimately believe in him. But that's not the only way people have understood this theological concept. Others have said that what it is is God, being omniscient and over time, looks into the future, sees those who are going to believe, and he seals their choice. He sets that destiny in stone and makes it secure. And yet, other people put the emphasis in a different place. They say it's God choosing the destiny of those who will believe or the destination. It it would be similar to if I said, hey, there's a a train and I'd love for y'all to take a trip with me. Everybody come hop on. And then once they're on the train, I say, okay, we're going to Chicago. What I was choosing was where the train is going, but everybody decides who's gonna get on that. So some people think the emphasis is less on God predestining who will believe, but rather destining what will happen to believers. A fourth option is that it has to deal with a, with a group, choosing a group rather than the individuals, that God's predestination is he is determining to save the church and then it is our faith that decides whether or not we are in that church that will be saved. Now, are you ready for the inside theological secret on which one is right? I don't know. I really don't. I, I, it seems like the last argument I read tends to persuade me. Um, and I stand in a place where I really don't know which one of these accurately reflects exactly what this concept is talking about. There are a couple of truths that we have on the table that we can anchor in on. One is that God is sovereign, that he is over all things, that he is infinite, that he knows everything, that he is eternal, eternity past to eternity future, that everything falls under his reign and that our choices matter, that we are not mindless robots living out of script, but that God made us in such a way to be able to exercise faith in him and to reject him, and that those choices are significant and real and we are accountable for them. And we also know that the gospel invitation is sent out to all. 
that God wants the gospel to be to proclaim to everyone, and that invitation is sincere and real. And the scriptures say that God doesn't delight in anyone, any sinner being punished, and he desires that everyone would be saved. So how do we put all of those pieces together coherently? God is sovereign over everything. Our choices still matter. God wants everyone to be saved. He offers salvation to everyone, and yet some ultimately will not believe. I don't know. That's above my pay grade. I imagine it would take the infinite mind of an infinite God to sort all that out. And while I think it's completely understandable that we have these questions, I also think these philosophical questions about God's sovereignty and free will are kind of beside the point of what Paul's talking about here. I do not think God brings up God, or Paul brings up God choosing us and predestining us to send us into a quandary about will and sovereignty. Let's take a look at the passage again and see if we can catch a little bit of what Paul was meaning to say. Because remember, all of this is under the banner of God blessing us, of God doing good to us. He says, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In what's the word? Love. He predestined us for, what's the next word? Adoption. What is the purpose of these statements here? He chose in love, he predestined for adoption. See, in in the Greek world, they believed in something called fate. Fate was a mindless rule of how everything would end up. There's even one myth of Zeus wanting to intercede on someone's behalf, but finding out fate had decided otherwise, so Zeus is powerless. In the Greek world, fate doesn't care about you. And what Paul's saying is, hey, the person who's sovereign of the universe loves you. And he's made his choices out of love for you. And he's speaking in this word choosing in a very personal way. Have you ever been not chosen for something? I remember my sophomore year in high school, uh, going to Ravencrest with FSM for the first time. And high school church camps are a great place to encounter God and make relationships and experience deep rejection. And on the first night there, we were playing ultimate and we were going through this really terrible social ritual called the picking of teams. And the way it happened was they picked two captains and the captains are picking their teams to play Frisbee. And they're going one by one, and I'm watching the crowd of us waiting to be given validation and significance dwindle to the point that it's down to me and the really awkward, unathletic kid. And they picked the awkward, unathletic kid first. You can interpret what that says about me as a sophomore in high school. Have you ever been not chosen? Have you ever been not chosen for a relationship? not chosen for a job, not chosen to stay when the reorg happens, not chosen for that scholarship, for that program you really wanted to be in, that team that you really wanted to be a part of, rejected by a family member, had someone walk away from you that was supposed to be with you for life. To everyone who's ever experienced not being chosen, Paul is saying, God chose you. He has no buyer's remorse for you. He didn't throw out the gospel invitation and go, oh man, I did not think she was gonna take that. He desires you and he personally in love chooses you to be his child. It says that he chose you before the creation of the world. Has anybody else been freaking out about these new telescope photographs like we have been in our family? these images that we're getting from out deep in the galaxy, let's bring those up. Like I remember when we first saw those coming through, we threw them up on our TV screen and we're totally geeking out about how beautiful it was. And I wanted to try to understand the scope and scale of this. So I was just looking up measurements, like how big is that little dip in the valley there? And my mind, can't, I don't know how to measure in light years. Like I, I can't grasp the scale of how big that is. And the scriptures say that the stars are the work of God's fingers. Do you remember finger painting as a kid? Like, when I see these images, I can't help but imagine God just spinning the galaxies into existence. And Paul says that before God did that, he had you in mind. Let that sink in. 
you personally, fill your name in the blank, God said, I can't wait to make her my daughter. I can't wait to make him my son. I choose him or her and I am delighted. It brings me pleasure and joy to bring them into my family. That is the blessing that Paul is wanting to drive home here. Is that every single person in Christ was chosen and loved by God since before the creation of the world. And that's a powerful and secure idea. Before you ever had a chance to do anything to deserve it or all the things you and I have done that make us undeserving of that love, God knew it all and he chose you anyway. Now the reality is, we have done a lot to not deserve it. In fact, we're guilty of rebellion, of sin. Every single one of us has done unthinkable things, has thought unthinkable things, and have rejected God in horrible ways. And God had to do something about that. That choice that he made in eternity past to adopt us came with a price. As Paul walks through this section, he begins with an emphasis on what the Father has done. And in verse 7, he turns his emphasis to the Son. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. This word redemption has to do with the cost or the price of buying back a slave, of purchasing a person who is owned by another. And its theological significance comes out of our Old Testament and the story of Moses and the people of Israel and Egypt. You all seen the Prince of Egypt? We all on the same page here? Okay, good. That when God's people whom he had chosen found themselves enslaved, that God had to redeem them and rescue them out of their slavery. In a sense, Paul is saying that same pattern played out in our lives. God chose us, but we found ourselves enslaved to sin So God redeemed us and rescued us out of our sin and the price he paid was the death of his son. That his choice to love us in eternity past came at the cost of God's only son taking on flesh, walking among us and dying on our behalf so that he could wipe our sins clean, so that he could make a way for our adoption into God's family to happen. And it goes even further than that. Not only did he redeem us and forgive us of our sins, But verse eight says, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Paul's saying, not only did he redeem us, he made us insiders. He brought us into the plan. It is as if a Navy SEAL team went in and raided some kind of human trafficking operation, rescued some people out of slavery and said, oh, by the way, we're also gonna make you part of the president's cabinet. Like, we're rescuing you out of this horrible situation and we're giving you a seat at the table to be insiders on what the boss's plan is. That's what Paul's saying here. Is that not staggering? That God rescued us out of rebellion and made us his friends, brought us on the inside. That's what Jesus said. I call you friends now because I'm telling you what I'm up to and I'm making you a part of this mission. What's the end result of the mission? Verse 10, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. This is speaking to the last days when everything comes together. And what is the aim? To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Paul has reached into eternity past. Before the creation of the world, God chose us and loved us and planned to adopt us. In this present age, God stepped into reality and died for us. He made us a part of his plan and now he looks to eternity future and says everything in heaven and on earth, the entire cosmos is gonna be put under Christ's rule. And we're a part of that. He wants us to get that we've been swept up in this massive cosmic plan to bring the entire universe together under Jesus. He goes on further and he says in verse 11, in him we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are first to put our hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Check out that phrase, 
according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. Not only does God have a plan for your ultimate destiny, he's actually working every detail of the world out in accordance to his plan. So that means that the God who is capable of creating galaxies is involved and concerned with every detail of your life. That means he can be trusted with your last medical diagnosis. He can be trusted in your grief. He can be trusted with your teenage child that you're terrified of the decisions that they're making and you don't know how they're gonna turn out. He can be trusted with your finances. He can be trusted with that conflict that is just wearing you out right now. That the God who is sovereign over the universe and over your salvation can be trusted in every aspect of your life because he does everything well. And all of this is just him lavishing grace on us for his praise. In verse 13, he's talked about the work of the Father in choosing, the work of the Son in redeeming, and now he looks at the work of the Spirit. In verse 13, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Paul says that God made a down payment. Isn't that amazing? How humble of God. Why do we make down payments? To show that we're good for the rest of the payments, right? It's putting some skin in the game to say I can be trusted to keep my word. Think about how humble it is that God chose to make a down payment for us to guarantee that he was gonna keep his word to rescue us and redeem us. And that down payment, he says, is the Holy Spirit who comes into our lives and begins to transform us and give us a taste of what ultimate transformation is gonna be like. He starts changing us now as evidence of the complete change he's gonna work, and it's described as a seal. Now, this idea of a seal for nerdy people like me who really like Lord of the Rings, um, you're very familiar with this concept. A seal would have been a unique mark that a ruler or an important person would have a metal embossed thing that they would put in wax and seal over letters to show that it was authentic and from them. And when that seal, if it goes to the person it's being sent to and it hasn't been broken, it's a guarantee that it has made it from sender to recipient untampered with. Paul says that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. That he is guaranteeing that those who believe in Christ will make it from faith to glory untampered with, is God's promise that he's gonna finish what he started in our lives. The amazing thing to me about all these is we have to take on faith that all of them are happening. There's no blood test you can do that will come back with the result of, yep, sin's forgiven. You can't see these things. God's telling you that he's done them. And it's for us to trust and believe. It's also interesting to me to look at the disproportionate work on God's behalf and on ours. Look at the verbs of what God does in this paragraph of praise versus what we do. God chose, predestined, adopted, lavished grace, redeemed, made known, and sealed. What did we do? We heard and believed. That's it we hear this incredible good news and we trust that good news and God does all of these incredible things on our behalf. And I think that Paul is shaping how we understand ourselves. There's an obsession in our culture right now with the idea of identity and seeking after identity to, to find yourself, discover yourself. I think that's why we love every new personality inventory that comes out. We love talking about ourselves and we love reading books about ourselves. Now, there's a very real and good need to understand who you are and understand your significance. But pursuing that by an obsession with finding yourself actually turns into a dark and twisted narcissistic pursuit. What Paul is saying here if you, is that if you really want to understand your significance, get your eyes off of yourself and on a God who loves you so that you'll find the deepest significance you could imagine. The other thing I think Paul is doing with his praise letter is I think he's modeling for us. Just like we've probably done this or seen this done dozens of times, right? 
family sits down for dinner and mom says, dad, thanks for making us such a great dinner. This is amazing. And mom's expecting what's gonna happen after. Kids are gonna go, yeah, dad, thanks. So when mom says thanks, yes, she's sincerely thanking, but she's also expecting that everyone else will recognize what she's doing and join in. When Paul opens his letter with praise God for this and for this and for this and for this, he's expecting his recipients will join in and go, yeah, God has blessed me immensely. Now this letter to Ephesians is gonna have all kinds of amazing theology about what God has done and all kinds of challenges for how we respond. But to start, what if we followed Paul's example and took a week to count our blessings? What if we took a week to simply recount to God all the things he's done for us? I would even suggest take it day by day for the next week, five minutes at the start of your day, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, what if you woke up and just reflected on the truth that God has chosen you and told him thank you? And each day this week, we celebrated what God has done on our behalf, the good and gracious and glorious God who loved us before the creation of the world and promises to finish what he started in redeeming us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your lavish grace on our behalf. And I pray that this week as we, as we spend some time just sitting in, reflecting in, remembering and thanking you for what you've done. I pray that as we get our eyes off ourselves and on you, that it'll transform everything about who we are. That you will receive glory and we will receive joy. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.